to video 8-1 part A. Today we're going to be exploring how prokaryotes are the oldest forms of life on earth and over billions of years have evolved a wide range of metabolisms that have changed the atmosphere and geology of the earth. First let's consider this person holding this pen and if we were to zoom in on that pen we would see hundreds of bacteria as shown in this color enhanced photograph and uh, taken with the scanning electron microscope. The bacteria have a very simple appearance, but that simplicity belies a complex metabolism that we can see among a wide range of prokaryotes. Here we're looking at some an, an example of those prokaryotes, uh, such as these bacteria, that are using the sugars and proteins in milk to generate lactic acid. And that lactic acid is creating an acidic environment, causing the milk to curdle, which helps to create cheese. Another form of uh, fermentation is shown here in this video, and I'm going to play that so you can see it. Oh my god! Oh my so you can see that big fireball that was created. That's from methane gas. So there are a type of um, prokaryotes called methanogens that live um, in the bottom of uh, swamps and lakes, and as they generate uh, methane gas, that methane gets accumulated under the ice and those people broke a hole through the ice igniting that and they created a big fireball. Both of these forms of metabolism are known as anaerobic metabolism and that occurs without oxygen. So for example, your own body creates lactic acid in the presence of anaerobic uh, exercise as well. Here we're looking at another form of metabolism called chemosynthesis. So at the bottom of the ocean, we have um, these prokaryotes that are using hydrogen sulfide and other chemicals created by these hydrothermal vents in the ocean to generate uh, food without the presence of sunlight. These organisms are also thermophilic because they can tolerate very high temperatures without dying. Another unusual form of uh, metabolism is found in these halophiles that love very salty environments. Um, sometimes they're known as extremophiles because they live in places that most organisms can't. And these particular um, halophiles are doing chemosynthesis or uh, an unusual form of metabolism, uh, photosynthesis that doesn't use uh, chlorophyll, but instead bacterial rhodopsin. Both organisms are known as archaea, including our methanogens, um, because they are distinct from bacteria um, genetically and metabolically but they do lack a nucleus and therefore they are prokaryotes. Another form of metabolism well, more familiar to us is photosynthesis. This is taking place in these cyanobacteria living in um, this uh, very uh, sort of polluted water, a lot of sewage and so forth from the city which contains nitrogen, allowing these algal blooms to occur. And uh, we can also find cyanobacteria in places like normal mud uh, give them a little bit of uh, nutrients and some sunlight and they begin to then grow as you can see up here. And um, cyanobacteria are typical cells, meaning that they contain uh, DNA, um, ribosomes, a cell wall, they have a cell membrane. But what makes them unusual is they also have thylakoids for capturing light and enzymes for helping them uh, create sugars. And when you learn about photosynthesis later, uh, when you learn about chloroplasts, you'll see that chloroplasts also have thylakoids and the same kind of system for converting carbon dioxide to sugar. And that's because chloroplasts evolved from a group of cyanobacteria um, over a billion years ago. Another form of metabolism here is uh, nitrogen fixation. We're looking at the roots of a bean plant and if we zoom in on that we can see these little nodules which contain a type of um, bacteria known as rhizobium bacteria, which convert uh, nitrogen gas from the atmosphere into eventually a form of uh, fertilizer for the plant, which help it make proteins and nucleic acids in part of the nitrogen cycle. Now, if we were to classify these organisms um, among um, other, uh, let's say in this case compared to eukaryotes, we'd see that they are um, broken into these three domains um, based on their ribosomal RNA. So for example, we have our cyanobacteria, we have um, the thermophiles we looked at, methanogens, halophiles, as well as our animals, fungi, and plants. I'd like you to consider this question, however. 
What does this phylogeny imply about the history of life? So I'm gonna, um, I'd like you to pause and think about that question. All right, so imagine as an analogy, a old tree growing in your backyard. And that tree might be 200 years old, might even have a swing hanging from one of those major branches. And the very upper part of that tree are small twigs with leaves. So what grew most recently in the tree, the small twigs or the major limbs? So if you said the smaller twigs, you are correct. In the same way, animals, fungi, and plants are like the small twigs of this tree of life. And as we go down deeper here, these are the major limbs, which this implies is that bac uh, ancient bacteria and archaea were some of the oldest forms of life on Earth. We can also verify that by looking at fossils. Some of the oldest fossils on the planet are prokaryotes, such as these stromatolites. Stromatolites such as these found in Glacial National Park are uh, made from bacteria which grow in warm, shallow seas, which imply that at one time um, the, the North America was once closer to the equator, um, allowing these stromatolites to grow. So let's look at what a stromatolite is. A stromatolite is sort of like a prokaryotic reef. So instead of made from a coral animal, it's made from little tiny bacteria such as these cyanobacteria. And those cyanobacteria, what they do is they grow through photosynthesis. Uh, let's look at the top here. And as the cyanobacteria grow, the uh, sea brings, uh, through high tide, brings uh, sediments like sand and mud. And the sticky cyanobacteria trap that sandy mud. And as they grow, they create these layers um, of, of sediment. So they'll grow through the sediment, um, get sticky uh, and therefore more sediment sticks on top of them and they create these layered rocks or stromatolites. What we can do is we can take cross sections of fossils of stromatolites like the one I showed you from Glacial National Park and scientists can find these micro fossils in them such as this cyanobacterium from a stromatolite that was found in Australia that's over a billion years old. One way we can get an idea uh, of how old these fossils are is by doing something called radiometric dating. So radiometric dating works uh, in the, the idea of looking at older rocks being um, uh, layer rocks being on the bottom here being older than those on the top. So one way this happens is in the ocean, uh, sediments um, accumulate as rivers dump um, sand and mud and things like that in the ocean. So as organisms die, they get buried by layer by layer by layer. One way to think about this is imagine if you had 365 um, pairs of uh, sets of clothes. Every day you take off uh, that set and you throw it into a pile and that accumulates. So the uh, clothes on the very bottom of your pile you wore 365 days ago, the clothes you wore most recently are on the top. And that is the basic principle of radiometric dating. Um, another way that scientists can classify a little bit more accurately is uh, through um, uh, using the half-lives of radioisotopes. So for example, uranium-238 breaks down into lead. Um, so after one billion years, uh, there's half of the uranium-238 uh, still there, whereas the rest of ha the other half is broken into lead. So we could use this idea of this sort of constant breakdown of radioisotopes to find the age of something. Um, so let me give you an example of that. So imagine we have uh, a piece of wood um, and that wood is made out of carbon-14 and that carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. An ancient tree containing one-eighth of its original carbon-14, uh, so therefore you want to determine how old that wood is. So I'd like you to pause and think if you found a tree that has one-eighth of its carbon-14 left how old is that wood? And you can look at the picture at the bottom to help you figure that out if you like. So if you said that it is 17,190 years old, you are correct. And that's because if it has one eighth of its carbon-14, uh, that is also 12.5% uh, of that carbon-14 that's left. We can look at other types of um, radioisotopes such as uh, potassium-40, 
uh, rubidium 87, uranium 238, uranium 235 to date things. And you can see that we can uh, use various forms of radioisotopes to date things by um, if they're thousands of years old, millions of years old, or even billions of years old. This form of dating is sometimes called radiometric dating. So now let's look at a bigger picture. Imagine we're trying to uh, use our understanding of prokaryotes and how they've evolved over time to understand how uh, metabolism and living organisms have changed the actual atmosphere of the planet. So we can see in this graph carbon dioxide levels uh, go down over billions of years. So here is four and a half billion years, here is the moder here's the present day. And based on this model here, carbon dioxide levels have dropped, whereas oxygen levels have gone up. And we're going to uh, ignore methane in this example. So one way we can understand that is by looking at this uh, ancient forest. It's about 300 million, year million years old in this depiction. And as these ancient trees die, uh, they take the carbon and oxygen that they take, took in through photosynthesis and they generate uh, these fossil fuels such as coal. And in coal seams, um, miners can actually find these ancient remnants of these trees such as this is actually a, a type of horsetail. Um, and here's some more of those trees shown here. And so what these trees are acting as is sort of as a carbon sink, taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and burying that in coal. So we could call coal a biogenic rock, biogenic sedimentary rock, because it is of biological origin and it ultimately uh, stores carbon. So if we were to burn coal, the carbon that it's sto uh, storing is then released again into the air as carbon dioxide. Another way that carb uh, life can um, pull carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is through uh, the formation of limestone. So we're looking at um, the White Cliffs of Dover in England, and believe it or not, these giant white cliffs of uh, limestone are made up from trillions and trillions of these tiny little shells called coccoliths. And these shells are made of carbon, um, made of calcium carbonate, which contains carbon and oxygen. So let's see how this works. Carbon dioxide reacts with uh, water to form carbonic acid, and that carbon dioxide. Um, or that carbonic acid, rather, will react with calcium to form calcium carbonate, which is used in the shells, such as in the coccolith that I showed you in the previous picture. So limestone, uh, or calcium carbonate as it's sometimes called, and other sedimentary rocks are carbon sinks, storing what was once carbon dioxide now in the actual rock. So if we were to take this limestone, another example of a biogenic rock, and put some acid onto it, it would fizzle, fizz and bubble and release carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. But right now it's storing that carbon oxygen uh, and therefore is a carbon sink. So uh, to wrap things up, let's uh, look at this uh, another big picture here. We're looking at Earth compared to Venus and Mars. And we can see that Venus and Mars contain large amounts of carbon dioxide and little to no oxygen gas. So what we've seen is that life has changed the atmosphere Let's review that process. Uh, first, in the first few billion years of Earth history, uh, life is anaerobic. We have processes such as fermentation, chemosynthesis, and nitrogen fixation evolving. Over time, uh, cyanobacteria and other photosynthetic organisms evolve to release oxygen gas. Uh, the world becomes more aerobic over time, more oxygen gas. Um, and the carbon dioxide that was in the planet ultimately gets buried uh, to form things like limestone and coal. So as a wrap-up question, I'd like you to think about this last idea. How do you think prokaryotes set the stage for eukaryotic evolution? And with that, I'm not going to answer that question, but I'd like you to think about that. Uh, that will set the stage for future discussions. So I hope you enjoy the video and uh, stay curious.